everyone to STEMcast. Um, I'm so excited to talk to Ruchi today. Um, I guess we can start off with maybe a little bit of a background about you know how where you started and where you are today. I started out um, in uh, engineering um, several years ago. Uh, came to the Bay Area because this is where it seems like a lot of the engineering development has been happening over the last few years. Um, I've been here for a while and have been privileged to be part of all the developments in technology that have occurred. So can you tell us about what you currently do, where you work, and you sure. know, what, you're, what you do, and then um, maybe add to that like a, like a really cool aspect, like something, like a fun fact about your job? Sure. Um, I currently work at Google. Um, I do system architecture, and what that means is building uh, hardware and software for solving problems. I work um, in the data center team at Google, um, also engage with Google Search. In the past, I've worked um, at Apple. Um, I was uh, part of a team that built the Apple displays uh, on Apple consumer products. And, you know, I worked in networking and other uh, jobs in the past. Uh, I started out my life as a hardware engineer, which means, you know, for most people, interacting with hardware occurs through their personal devices. So you buy a phone, you buy a computer, that's what hardware means for most people. And, you know, when people buy a phone or a computer, they're always looking for something that is, has the most performance, runs at the highest gigahertz, and so on. But I think we've lost appreciation for what that means. And so what I wanted to do today was kind of bring that sense of wonder back about how much technology has progressed in the last few decades. Um, I think we've all heard that a CPU today has billions of transistors in maybe one square inch of silicon. And I wanted to kind of highlight how what that means, you know, because it's a fact that we cannot wrap our heads around. So if a transistor was one millimeter in dimension today, the, the CPU would be roughly two square miles. So that is how many transistors are on a CPU. And the fact that technology has progressed to the point that, you know, that's possible is is really amazing. An iPhone today has more processing power than a desktop computer did 10 years ago. And this rapid evolution in technology has fueled society, has fueled changes in society that we take for granted. If you go to an airport today and you look around while you're waiting for to board your flight, you'll see everybody is on their phone. And 10 years ago, we didn't have phones. And so society has evolved rapidly and we are taking the pace of technological change has been super high and we take all of that for granted. But we are truly privileged to have been part of that journey. Yeah. And it continues and, and, and we don't know where it's going. Right, so. and you have like been a part of that journey, right? We you all know, have, from, yes. Right, yes. exactly. It's awesome. Tell me about your work coming out of college and what your experience has been. Yeah, I mean, so I, so I majored in computer science and then I wanted to, when I graduated, I wanted to really like have my work affect people in a positive way. That was really important for me. So um, I didn't want to join like a, like a Facebook or something where I didn't feel like I was directly, you know, helping people. Um, what resonated with me personally more was a pharmaceutical company. I felt like I could help them to, you know, make their internal processes better with technology, help them manage their data better, um, and hopefully help to drive the drug discovery process more. So I joined Gilead Sciences um, as a software engineer. That was an awesome experience, um, and I did that for um, about a year and a half, but in the in, within Gilead, I found myself more drawn towards the management. So I enjoyed, you know, creating the software, but I also really enjoyed talking to people, and I really like liked, you know, shadowing our users and. 
figuring out, you know, what exactly, how they were using our existing products and how we could better serve them um, and make improvements to our, to our products. And so I was like, what is that? You know, I had no idea. I had done software engineering internships all through college. So mm -hmm. I really didn't have a really good sense of like, what other jobs you could get, you know, within a technology company. Right. Um, so did some more research and then found that what was my, you know, more of a passion for me was product management. Um, I liked that it was strategic. You were thinking about your users' needs. You were thinking about the business needs. And it also, like, required a lot of communication, which I really liked. I liked, you know, interacting with people. So... Um, I decided to to switch within Gilead to be a PM for the team. Very nice. Um, Do you enjoy the transition from computer science to product management? I do. Yeah, I think it was a better fit for me. Um, I liked, as I said, I like technology problems, and I I think you know learning about new technologies is definitely fun. I think the day to day of you know being a computer scientist or a software engineer versus being a product manager that being a PM fit fit my you know I think my passion a little bit more. Nice. Yeah. What made you go into engineering as opposed to some other pursuit? Yeah. Um, well, in high school, I did not want to do engineering. I didn't have any really good math teachers. I didn't have good physics teachers who really inspired me to kind of take that on. It was very much like, okay, this is what the math problem is, and you know, this is how you solve it, go do that. And so um, I, I thought math was hard, I thought physics was hard, I thought computer science was for boys. I didn't want to have anything to do with it in high school. Um, all of my friends were the same way, I think. It was very much like a mass, like everyone around you kind of thinks the same. I don't know, you know if you've heard that, but it's like, you know, people around you influence you the most. And so that was, it was definitely like, I didn't like it and then my friends didn't like it. So they kind of like, you know, emphasized my views um, and like kind of reinforced my views that math was hard and computer science was for boys. So I wanted to be a vet, actually a veterinarian because I really liked animals and I liked biology. I liked, you know, learning about like our own bodies and that kind of thing that was interesting. Um, so I actually, I, I wanted to be a veterinarian, but you know, I, I wasn't quite sure if that was the route to take because veterinarian school is extremely hard to get into. And, um, and so I went undeclared to computer science. Um, and your question was, you know, how, do you, how did you get into engineering? And really it was from trying things out, you know, really like taking a computer science class. I had never even thought to, but my dad was like, you should take a computer science course. Um, and so I took it and then I thought it was fun. I actually understood it because I had a great teacher. Um, and then there were other women in the class too. Um, not as many as the guys, but definitely like a good amount of women where I didn't, I wasn't the only one. Um, so I quickly made friends with them and we kind of formed a little study group and that helped me a lot throughout the four years. Um, but I think it was definitely a combination of like trying it out, finding it good, like fun, um, having a great teacher to kind of reinforce um, that fun and, and make it fun. Um, and, and then I think there's also a practical aspect of it too. Like we all knew, you know, I graduated in 2015 and we all kind of knew like at that time, like software was really taking off, mm -hmm. apps were taking off, mobile was taking off. And so um, I think there's also a practical aspect of like, I want to help people what is the best way to do that? And I like computer science, I like technology, and clearly that's the future. So that was another thing too. I think it was a lot of practical things too. How do I get a job after college? <laughs> yeah. You know? Two very important points that you made was the importance of having inspiring teachers and also that you were able to find something that you enjoyed but you didn't even know it was enjoyable because you were the environment did not push you that way and that's that's a very powerful lesson um, there may be influ forces in our environment that prevent us from seeing what our true passions are so where did you go to school like where were you born and then kind of sure did you go to school sure I was born in India 
I did my undergrad there. Um, going into undergrad, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, whether I wanted to do um, arts or economics or engineering or medicine, uh, but it, it ended up being that I uh, picked up engineering. I went to um, a school in India called IIT. Um, and then after I finished my undergraduate studies there, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do a job or not. Um, I applied to colleges here in the U.S. and I ended up coming here for grad school and that's how I came to the Bay Area. I did my grad school in Stanford um, and, you know, I've been here since. Just like talking about your background is like, it's so impressive, right? IIT, Stanford. What's, so, you know, I would be curious to know what is one time that you failed? Like, what is one time that things didn't go well for you or as you planned and then how did you kind of cope with that and then get out of that situation or kind of you know cope with that situation sure and you know when we talk of failure it's something that may not have happened early in life but failure is a constant in all our lives you know if we all look at our past experience success is less of a constant than failure we all face failure in many many ways every day of our lives um, maybe it means that you went for an interview and you didn't make the interview. Maybe you want a job really badly or a project at your job and you don't happen to get that. Or maybe you want to impress somebody and that person underestimates you. That's a failure too. So it's something that's a constant in our lives. And the one thing I want to say about failure is Looking back on failures that I've had, um, there isn't a single one of those that I didn't grow from. Each one of those is an opportunity for growth, for um, you know, learning um, a different way of doing things, yeah. maybe reaching out for a different opportunity than the one you were targeting before. And so that's the beautiful part about failure is that it can, um, and once you, recognize that pattern, then it's not so scary anymore. It's, um, it's part of life and you just kind of see how you can best get over it. Um, so in many ways, you know, that's, that's the constant rather than the success. So you mentioned you're a hardware engineer and I think a lot of people don't know what that is. Um, you know, they, a lot of people use, you know, consumer devices and things like that that obviously need hardware engineering but they don't know what that is. Can you kind of break down the iPhone in very like high level terms? Sure. And what are the components that are hardware and what are the components that are software? So we get a really good sense of like what is hardware versus what's software. Sure. The transistors are the building blocks of everything today and that mm -hmm. is hardware. Um, and so what we have today is we are able to fabricate billions of these transistors on small pieces of silicon. Silicon is basically a form of sand mm -hmm. that uh, you know we can use to fabricate these transistors. Um, and so we used, we have designed techniques to fabricate these transistors onto silicon and um, we can make the silicon do anything we want. But most importantly what we make the silicon do is build processors. I don't know if you've heard, you know, I'm sure our audience has heard the term processors or CPUs. Uh, what can you define that for Sure, us? sure. Yeah. CPUs are essentially things that can perform lots. It's like your calculator, except a much more powerful form of your calculator. Mm -hmm. It can do a lot of Thanks. computations yeah. um, and, and just do them very, very fast and, and at a very, very large scale. That then becomes the building block for software to write, to use these instructions to do the various things that we see our iPhone doing. So for example, if we are doing FaceTime with somebody, mm -hmm. um, someone has written a program that, you know, at the very, very low level, there's a camera that is taking pictures of people who are doing FaceTime with each other and there is maybe some hardware that is translating the camera pictures into a signal, but then processing the signal 
and sending it across the internet is something that software does. Mm -hmm. So really the boundary between hardware and software is not fixed. The more, uh, you know, it's possible to do certain things in hardware, uh, but software can really use these processors to uh, take these signals that are coming in from the cameras and modify them as needed so that at the end of the day this picture goes out across the internet and changes our lives because we have you know people who are in touch with each other at any time of day across geography across boundaries uh, that previously would have prevented us from being in touch and kind of bring society closer together can we have software without hardware no hardware is the building block that allows that software uses as a tool to do what it wants to do. Can we have hardware without software? You could, but it wouldn't do very much because at the end of the day, I guess you could have hardware without software, but it may not be the best experience for most of us. So for example, if I have a camera that's simply taking pictures, a pinhole camera, that's hardware without any software. But a pinhole camera without any processing of the pictures will not take very pretty pictures. So being able to take those pictures and apply various uh, rules to the pictures makes them more consumer friendly or usable. So software is definitely an enhancement to hardware. You could have hardware without software, but maybe not very user friendly. So how many transistors are in an iPhone? You know, I would have to do some really quick math to tell you exactly how many transistors, um, but I can give you a little bit of Ball, more, ins ballpark, more yeah. insight of what's in an iPhone. Definitely, um, it would be, you know, over a billion transistors in a very small piece of silicon. Amazing. If, you, yeah. if you open up an iPhone, most of it is battery. It's... Um, there's probably one large chip in there that a large piece of silicon that's doing most of the processing for all the things that the iPhone does. There may be a few small chips here and there, but the large chip is the most important one. Actually, if you have multiple chips, the, the cost of sharing work between multiple chips is actually very expensive and so there's a lot of motivation to integrate all the work into one piece of silicon or one chip um, and so that's the way the industry has gone um, and today most of the most of the name of the game is to put as much hardware on a single piece of silicon as possible because it's very expensive to communicate between chips in terms of power and, and resources. Um, so that's why if you open your iP iPhone today, you'll find that it's mostly one big chip. And that chip has billions of transistors. You know, to build something like the iPhone requires a tremendous amount of engineering across the stack, across hardware as well as software. Um, you have people who are dealing with the physics of the device, so they understand you know, what's happening at the molecular level. Um, and then you have people who are building, who understand how to put circuits together, but they're still at the molecular level. They're not designing with the circuits. Then you have the people who understand what they want to design. So, you know, maybe they want to put in a circuit that takes uh, photos that are coming off of a camera and process them a certain way. Um, so that's at, at a higher level of abstraction. Um, and then people who do this design, um, you know, these are very complex designs. So someone actually has to make sure the designs work at scale because you have billions of people using these iPhones and, um, you know, any one bug or problem in these iPhones is going to affect people in many, many ways. So making sure that these circuits are performing correctly is a task in itself and that requires a large team of people as well. And then uh, above that is uh, at a next higher level of abstraction is the whole software team which itself has you know, different um, levels of contribution. And then above, above everything else is the app developer who 
doesn't know anything about the transistors that are uh, you know, built at the lowest level. All they know is they see certain rules or functions that they can take advantage of. And there's this whole stack or hierarchy that's been built and the app developer takes advantage of those rules and you know, develops their yeah, app. Yeah. But there's a lot of engineering, years and years, decades of engineering that goes into putting one of these together. And we've used the iPhone as an example, but the same is true of any device, whether it's a computer or even your DSLR, your camera. These are all devices that take a tremendous amount of engineering and we kind of take that for granted today. So what do you like to do for fun? I really love photography. I like to take my camera out and shoot birds and wildlife. Um, I also love food. Um, it's, you know, the opportunity or the prospect of eating something good and tasty is not something I can turn away from. So that's definitely a passion. Um, and I love to read. Um, so uh, I like trying new experiences. I love traveling. Um, yeah, anything that helps me learn something new is, is fun. How about you? Um, I have a lot of passions in um, outside of work in the Indian classical arts. So I learned the Indian classical dance form called Bharatanatyam for like 20 years. Um, Very still nice. continue to learn it and teach it. Um, I like composing music uh, for Bharatanatyam, so Indian classical music. Um, that's definitely a big passion of mine. And then I also have a nonprofit organization that I founded um, that puts on, you know, dance music pr art productions that are really themed on celebrating women's empowerment and celebrating feminism. Um, and so I get different artists from the Bay Area or wherever, whichever city I'm doing it in and kind of sell, help to support local artists, but also help to kind of raise awareness and celebrate, you know, women's empowerment. That's so, awesome. You're yeah. one of the few people who can bridge the divide between art and science. And that's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was amazing. I mean, you are incredible and I learned a lot, but I hope that our viewers, you know, learned a lot and, Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambika. It was great talking to you, getting to know your background, and you know, touching on the things that um, our viewers can learn yeah. from. Yeah.